Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Both joined by Drew Galloway. We are here for yet another start of the week, and we have basketball galore to get to. And we'll just start right off the top and dive into one of the latest commits for K-State uh, with the hecticness of everything going on this weekend. Obviously, the basketball team gets Brendan Housen on Friday and then Dylan Edwards and everything that went down on Sunday. We have time for just a specific Bay Fall video, and there's not a lot in the Bay Fall situation to really dive into because we didn't get to see a ton of him last year. We talked about it a little bit on the Sunday show yesterday, uh, but K-State did add a guy in Bay Fall that – retains his four stars that he had as a high school recruit into the transfer portal. And I say that as a significant thing because we'll dive into some stuff about K-State's roster in a little bit and talk about with all the departures and the incoming players, have there been upgrades, what's what's going on there? And K-State has a handful of guys that they had those four stars coming out of high school and they've dropped a star even after just one year and not seeing the four. Bayfall only played nine games at a really bad Arkansas team, but he retained those four stars. That is at least a telling sign and probably the way that a lot of people should look at this as this is a really good developmental ad for K-State where there's high upside here and you don't lose anything by bringing Bayfall into your roster because you have 13 scholarships to work with. Somebody's got to have the 13th scholarship or the 12th one. And if it's going to be Bayfall, then that's a really good option to have there to kind of stash away and hope that as time goes on, he's put himself in a position to be on the floor and can be a significant contributor, which is what they tried to do with Jarrell Colbert. He got to the level where they at least trusted him to be out here, out there. He could do some things that they needed him to, but ultimately he wasn't good enough to be a difference maker and winning at a higher level. And that's why they've moved on. Bay Fall comes in, three years left to play, and he might be able to be that guy that you take a flyer on and it works out. Filling out a roster now is just an impossible task to try and get to try and keep 13 guys happy for an entire season. But I think that with how everything played out for Bayfall, because I, I think that people don't realize that this Bayfall visit and commitment and eventual signing was all on the books for a, a while. Like he, I believe he even committed to the staff on like Monday or Tuesday of last week, kind of before before he even visited because he just knew that he wanted to go to K-State and the K-State coaches really prioritized him. And I mean, they, they were up front with him and also said that they were going to take another five because they, they think that they need more post-depth right now, which they're right. But you look at you look at Bayfall and he just oozes so much potential because he was such a highly rated prospect and he was a highly rated prospect for a reason. I mean, there, there are a lot of tools that you can work with. And if Casey can really maximize his potential, I mean, nothing is a guarantee anymore in college basketball. And I mean, we'll, we'll get into that <laughs> later on. But he's somebody where if they could really hone in and get him to develop more this year and kind of use this as a developmental year, that you, this, the, potential and the sky is the limit for him i mean he's 6 11 with a 7 4 wingspan can do a little bit of everything i mean his ceiling would even be a stretch five because he can shoot the ball a little bit but he's just really really raw right now and he's the perfect guy i think to come in and be able to just see where he's at and, and i think that it means something at least from my perspective it means something that Eric Musselman wanted to take him from Arkansas to USC. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good point because th there are a lot of situations where a coach could say, Ooh, we got this guy. This is like my get out of jail free card. I'm taking a new job. Uh, I have no obligation to take him with me, but there was interest there. And that means that Eric Musselman still saw something in a guy like Bayfall. And uh, I think this is probably one of those that we'll keep an eye on and see. And I, this is not one that people should just go over the moon about right now and be like, this is this is amazing. Like, don't confuse it for what it is, but this is still a good get. And in terms of what you can find at times in the transfer portal, um, this is a lot better than, you know, some of the other flyers that other teams will have to take. And maybe eventually K-State will have to take in some way. Uh, but this is a good add and it adds to a pretty strong transfer portal class already, which Let's just move on now and talk about the current state of the roster at K-State because 
uh, I would not fault you if you're somebody out there that's a little concerned or you're at least taking a little bit of a moment to step back and say, man, is this going to work out for us? Like, what's going on here? Because K-State, as it currently sits, has eight players on their roster. There are five open scholarships to work with. And the news recently is that they've lost a handful of other players. Quez Glover is into the portal. Uh, but two of the big names at K-State ends up losing that it looked like they might be able to hang on to. You alluded to it earlier, Drew. But Day-Day Ames and R.J. Jones are into the portal. R.J. we knew earlier last week. That came a day or two before Brendan Housen committed, which we told people then, do not panic about losing R.J. Jones. Brendan Housen is essentially what you want R.J. Jones to be, just – Brendan Housen has proven that he can actually do it at the power six level in college basketball, as opposed to RJ Jones. He came in, got some shots up, but he shot under 30% last year. He just wasn't ready to contribute. Brendan Housen is ready to come in and contribute. He's got two years left to play. So that, that all makes sense. It all ties in together. Uh, certainly if K-State would have been able to keep RJ Jones, you should have been excited about that, but he wasn't going to see a ton of playing time this season. And that's why it makes sense. Now, the shocker in some ways that came out on Sunday after everybody was way up here high about the Dylan Edwards news is Data Ames said, I got to give these guys a little kick in the can. Uh, Data Ames is in the portal now. And that one hurts for K-State oh, slightly because this is a, a guy that you would have projected to still see on the floor last year. He finished really strong in Big 12 play. His shooting was better than what it was anticipated to be now higher volume, more opportunities. Would that have stayed the same? We'll see, but it was encouraging. Like There were a lot of reasons to think that Day-Day Ames was a hit in recruiting for K-State, a former four-star guy just inside the top 70 of the rankings in the class of 2023. But he's moving on. It's not the end of the world, though, if you're a K-State fan from the standpoint of what you're bringing in around these guys. Day-Day Ames is leaving because he – you know, somebody or he does not think that there will be a role for him next year uh, similar to last year or greater. You obviously want to expand on that. But I think that's I think that's just bad thinking on his part. I think Data Ames would have seen the floor a lot next season, and I don't envision him going to a better situation than K-State if he wants that type of role. Like, are you going to go to a Big 12 school or something adjacent to it and be able to play starters minutes next season, have the have the ball a lot, like all these other things, it's just not going to happen. I think that this is uh, one of those where, I mean, maybe he finds the right spot, and there certainly is that out there. But I just this is this is one of those moves that it's okay to scratch your head at and question these guys sometimes and say maybe he doesn't fully understand what's going on here because with what K State's brought in there's not really anybody that is taking away the specific role of day day Ames. Yeah. This is one where the two of us and uh, Derek kind of talked about, about we love day day Ames this potential, but the more thing, the thing that's like more concerning to us and just the future of not just K state, but college basketball in general is just how easy it is for kids to leave now than actual like than actually losing day day like i i'm a little bit baffled and then you see what i believe it was one of his parents said on social media and you get really confused by their thought process and their thinking i mean it it is good i guess for them and what you can say is that transferring now and maybe transferring even next year just maximizes your potential of making NIL money for a guy that's probably not an NBA guy. And I get it, but I just don't see him going to a school that is going to be as good as K-State or better and him not have a lower role. And it kind of goes back to what Jerome Tang talked about, I believe it was one of his first press conferences, is he said, you know, when I'm the coach, like, it's my job to get the best team on the floor. It's the other player's job to make sure that they're going to be on the best team. And, and I think that that kind of just says a lot of where college basketball is right now. And I told some of my friends, like, if I had more time to really go in depth on just college basketball as a whole, I'd be really interested to see 
how many times we've had a uh, guy that's transferred multiple times now compared to the guys that have stayed four years at one school. Because I think that the multi-time transfers would probably blow the four-year guys out of yeah. the water, which leads me to be like, is high school recruiting at the basketball or at, in college basketball worth it right now? And, and I, I just don't know if it is. Unless you get a surefire one-and-done kind of player, I, I'm not sure it's worth it because the guys that you want to come in and develop for four years are probably the ones that are going to be the most likely to leave. Yep. So it, it, it's hard to balance that out. And, and I think that if I was if I was a coach right now in, in basketball, because football is t- so totally different yep. because there, there's so many more players and more scholarships for basketball. I, and, I and keep in mind real quick, too, like the, the process that these guys go through in seeing the floor of the field and yes. college is essentially the same as high school, where I think in high school, you can be the biggest stud of a freshman, but you're probably not going to see the field on varsity no. as a freshman. Now, sophomore, maybe junior. Yep. You're there. Boom. Like there's already some of that kind of ingrained in a football player. They understand like, Hey, there's a really strong physical side of this. I got to be up to that and ready to go on the basketball side. You could, you could be a little weakling, but if you've got basketball talent, they're putting you on the floor as a freshman on varsity and and letting you go because basketball is a game about talent. Can you put the ball in the hole? Do you have a trait that we could use right now? And that's the same thing that applies here. So that's why I think we see it less in football yes. where it's, it's always been a developmental sport and the players, even as some would probably argue that at times and they're right, the players in football can, you know, have inflated ideas of what they are or how the thing works. They do still have probably a little bit more of a basis in reality on how, the college development side of this works because it's just natural in that sport. All of these other sports though, it's like, if I'm good, I'm on the field, I'm on the court and that changes things. So I think, I think you're absolutely right there. And especially like you look at, look at it from a raw numbers perspective. I know how much the data AMs turned it around really the last month or so of the season. But I mean, he had one of the worst offensive ratings of any K state player in the modern era up until the last month of the season. So that that's the part where it just sucks that like as a coach and I would just be really annoyed and frustrated with how college basketball works right now that we can spend all this year developing this freshman who for the most part during the season wasn't great until the last month. And then you bring in other guys because you want to build a better roster because you made the NIT last year you think that you're going to have this sophomore guard that has really started to turn around and figure it out at the power six level. And then you essentially say that he's going to get a similar role because what was really stopping him from having a similar role? I know that they brought in other guards, but they brought in other guards and they were still going to play him a lot. And then he still ends up transferring. So that's the part of me where college basketball just is in a bit of a flux and, where I agree with what DY has said that transfer portal regulation probably needs to be changed a lot sooner than an IL does. Well, and also like let I think we oh, we kind of inflate what Day Day Ames has finished the season was. It was good. He played well, but he he had 16 in the loss at Iowa, which was just a weird game from the standpoint of how people were throwing guys out there. Really, the most encouraging thing that Day Day Ames did at the end of the year was the shooting was way better than anybody ever anticipated it to be at K-State. So now you're banking on something that really we only have a month-long sample size of saying, will this continue? Will this keep going? I would have taken it and ran with it and said, yes, it would. Like I I wanted Data Ames to be on K-State's basketball roster next year. I think he yes. helps them win games next season. But you're not losing a totally irreplaceable player. And similar to the R.J. Jones thing, people should not make it a, a bigger deal than it is and inflate what day day aims meant to this team moving forward. Like I, I think you, you speaking of Jerome Tang and what he said about, you know, it's my job to put the best team on the floor. It's your job to make sure you can be on the best team. Like that's perfect for this situation here. And like you go and just look at last year at the end, he had 16 in the game against Iowa um, but the only other games that he had in double figures last season in conference play and on 
11 in the garbage time game against Houston. He had 10 in the garbage time game against KU. He had 10 against Texas, and he played well in that game. He had just five in the the must-have game against Iowa State, didn't make any of his shots from deep, and then 16 against Iowa. So it's not like he completely lit the world on fire. He did things that as a young freshman on a team that was struggling at times, you said, that's a piece moving forward that we could see develop. But the developmental side of this is is far fewer in the game of basketball now, and that's why a guy like David Castillo coming in there is at least a specific trait that he has that could get him on the floor early and give him a role. And it's the fact that he is able to shoot the basketball very well. And that's something that I think when you talk about high school recruiting, moving forward, you mentioned it earlier, it's either one and done guys or dudes that have specific skills that as a freshman can get them on the floor immediately. Because if not, I just don't know that there's any specific reason to go and get that guy that's going to take a year, year and a half to actually be on the floor and contribute because they're just going to leave anyways, whether that's after year one of not playing or after year two of only playing like eight minutes a game, it's going to happen. I mean, Jarrell Colbert is a perfect example of that. K-State got him into a position where they, they thought he was ready to play for them halfway through this past season, and it wasn't good enough for him. And he saw that, and it wasn't good enough for the coaches either, by the way. They were recruiting over him essentially but they still would have kept him around and given him that spot because he does have some skills that can be utilized for K-State. He thought he deserved a bigger role. He's into the portal. He still doesn't have a landing spot. Here are the players that K-State has lost from last season that have left early. So this doesn't include guys like Will McNair and Tyler Perry who graduated. They have no more eligibility remaining. And then the classes that they'll be in next year. So Data Ames and RJ Jones, a pair of future sophomores, Uh, R.J. Jones is kind of what I talked about with Bay Fall. Bay Fall, a class of 23 guy, did not lose his fourth star. R.J. Jones did lose his fourth star. He's the number 270 player in the portal. Day-Day Ames just went in yesterday. He's not ranked yet. I would venture to say that Day-Day Ames likely ends up keeping the fourth star, um, but it's going to be borderline. It's not a certainty. He'll be probably ranked similar to where Bay Fall was. Yeah, that's probably a good point. Quez Glover entered the portal, didn't play at all last season. Seemed like somebody K-State would have liked to have kept around for depth. But again, Quez Glover, his role on what he could have had last year, totally different from what it's going to be this upcoming year. Dorian Finister outside the top 700 in the transfer portal, which the fact that Dorian Finister is a three-star and outside the top 700 highlights just how many guys are in the transfer portal and how many serviceable players that can give you some minutes are in the portal and why it's a good reminder to not melt down about some of this. He's committed to Sam Houston. Jarrell Colbert doesn't even have a ranking from either on three or 24 seven in the portal. And then Cam Carter is the only top 100 guy that K-State lost. The four star with one year left to play is off to LSU. And then Arthur Kaluma, uh, he's in the NBA draft pool. He has until uh, exactly a month from today, May 29th to withdraw from the NBA draft process. It could come sooner. We'll see. But with the current setup that it has and with everything K-State's leaving, this is what the current roster looks like. Five open scholarships to play with. You see four transfers, three guys that were here last year, and then David Castillo, the lone freshman coming in next season. So what do we make about how the roster sits right now? And are you concerned that K-State is going to actually be able to put together a team that can compete in the Big 12? Because The pieces are there to be a good team. We like what they've done in the transfer portal, combining it with a guy like David Gasson. Maybe David Castillo comes in and gives you some minutes, but this is far from a complete roster if you want a team that's going to win basketball games in the Big 12 at a level high enough to get you back to the Big 12 tournament next year. You need some depth. You need a little bit more punch. And here we sit, you know, nearing a a timeline where Jerome Tang was hoping to have the roster completed. So, any doubt that K-State's able to to get this thing done and, and put together a roster that can win? No, I, I'm not concerned really at all, to be completely honest. I, I just think that with where K-State is, just if you look at guards, because I, I know that everybody's going to talk about that they don't really have a big man right now. I think that David David Gasson would be a fine five. And he, I mean, he was literally the five on a team that was a couple points for making the final four. So I think that he would be fine at the five. Uh, if 
if probably the worst case scenario played out, I think that he would be fine there. But if you just look at the guards, uh, I think that you'd be lying to yourself if you didn't think that K-State has dramatically improved in that aspect, uh, especially with Khalif Battle still out there. And I think that we both feel pretty confident where K-State stands for Khalif Battle right now. So, I mean, that, that, that that's Khalif Battle, C.J. Jones, Doug McDaniel, Brendan Housen, David Castillo is probably better than anything that K State would have had last year, even if Quez Glover would have been healthy. Yeah, I, I think that we can agree with that on paper. And uh, so I, I'm not real real concerned. I mean, if, if it's like June first and K State still has like one or two open spots and they still you still probably don't feel great about the four or five spot, then I'd be like, oh yeah, this is probably a little concerning now. But right now, it's like, I think that there's a reason that Data Ames and RJ Jones were willing to transfer. And I think it's because they, even though we talked about how Data Ames probably was going to have at least a similar role, I think that there was some concern about who he was going to run into playing time with from his side. And I, I just think that they're upgrading the roster so much, especially at the guard spot right now, that it's it's understandable for him to want to leave. It sucks. And like I said, like there needs to be some kind of regulation on this at some point. But I think that it's understandable from the perspective of they're just really, really stockpiling talent at guard. And before people get upset and be like, why are they recruiting so many guards? Do you not remember last year's team and how they had barely any guards that could play? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that they wanted to, that to happen again. Well, and you also want to be able to have the option where, hey, if it's just not a guy's night, you have somebody to turn to, not just having one or two guys there. Because we, we saw that last year where people would ask, well, why, why is he still playing? Cam Carter is unplayable right now. Yeah, there were absolutely times where Cam Carter was unplayable right now, but who, who else you did you play? want to play that spot? Because they didn't have another guard and they didn't have any other talent on this team that could actually give you a shot of sniffing a win. Like that was the thing where Cam Carter at his worst was going to give you more than what some of the guys on the K-State bench were going to give you. So that's where I, it's good to point out by you that, hey, you, you – you can really never have enough guards in this game because they're, you know, they're integral to this, the shooting, the, the passing, everything that a guard does, it's the catalyst to winning in basketball and especially college basketball right now, the bigs, so much of what they can do in this game is for most of them, except the highest of the high is set up off of what your guards do. And so you can toss anybody out there and, you know, they'll figure something out. Like, Will McNair and Jarrell Colbert, both frustrating at times last year, both also have moments where they figured it out well enough because of what the guards could do for them that K-State masked that problem at least slightly at times. So I think, obviously, K-State is, is looking hard at Khalif Battle, and that's one that for the last week probably, and really since we've heard Khalif Battle's name come up in the portal, it's felt like K-State is probably the front runner there. My confidence level in it, like if I, you know, I would have said going into the weekend that it was probably like an 85, 90% chance that Khalif Battle played at K State. I would say I've dropped into like the 70s range, just a little disappointed that K State didn't get that commitment over the weekend, but I still think they're the front runner because I can't throw out there a strong, uh, a strong second option that I feel like is a legitimate threat to K State right now. So that's big because that would add that final scoring punch that K-State needs. If you look at the current roster, that would get you a third player that averaged double figures last season. He can shoot it. And we also think that, hey, Housen's going to have a bit of an extended role this coming year. His, his scoring numbers might go up because the opportunities he gets. He'll have a healthy David Gasson. You're in a good spot. But you still need another true big to be out there uh, to feel really good about that top seven – that you'll throw onto the floor because having a strong top seven or eight is probably the key to winning basketball games. And that's the one thing where K-State's not out of the neck of, of the woods with Clifford Amore yet. Like 
he he has all these suitors. It's probably going to take a little bit longer before we get a final answer there. But Alabama just landed a, a center from Kentucky in the transfer portal uh, earlier. So the DY I know tweeted out and said, you know, might might be timely or something along those lines. It is significant to know that Clifford Amori is still probably in play for K-State, even if it's tough to make sense of where that recruitment is fully going right now. So that option is there for K-State. I think you really have to hope that gets done because if it does, then I think no matter what K-State does the rest of the way or what hits they take, I think they have a roster that's capable of finishing in the top five or six in the Big 12 next season. And that ultimately, to me, is the first goal that you should set for yourself, where it's, hey, preseason, we want to be able to project to people that we are a top third of the Big 12 type of team next year, top five or six. And then be like that first year Jerome Tang team where we get into conference play and people start have to say to themselves, okay, you know, maybe top half isn't exactly right. The expectation has grown. We know this team's better than that. This team should be a top three or four team. And, you know, hey, three weeks left in the season, six games to play. We can talk about them needing to do this to win a conference title. Like you have to build your goals. And I think if you get battle and Amore still, you put yourself in a position where you're on track for that to happen for what you need. Um, even if you just get battle, that puts you in a good spot. But you're, this staff will have to be really good inside the margins elsewhere to fill out the roster. I would agree with uh, with that. And I would even add, uh, I, I believe that he hasn't put one out since Data AM's left. So it'd be interesting to see where uh, he would have it now. But in the last John Rothstein uh, top 45, and I only bring up him because he's the only one that really goes past 26. Gary Parrish is weird and does top 26. Like either do do like a top 50 or do top 25. Like don't do a 26. That does nothing for me. Uh, but John Rothstein had case in at like number 28. And that was with Data Ames, obviously not with Khalif Battle. Uh on the roster yet and he still hasn't committed yet but i'd be interesting to see where rothstein would put k-state with without day day aims but adding khalif battle because they're they're a french top 25 team right now and that's without really knowing what's the potential of going on at the four spot or the five spot so if k-state could really stockpile some talent there then you're probably a preseason top 25 team maybe top 20 depending on who you get and I mean, it's like you said, like if you can be projected to be in the top half of the Big 12 in the preseason, I think that you're feeling good about yourself because I don't know if everybody has been paying attention to the rest of the league, but there are multiple people that have ha have put out a top 25, top 10, whatever. And, and the Big 12 has five teams yeah. in it and has the top three. So if you, if you want to get in the top half of the league, you can still you're you're still probably a top twenty team in the preseason. Yeah, no, you're uh, you're you're right about that. the The Big Twelve is getting a lot of love there. Um, you know, some teams I think it's deserved. The others, I'm like, eh, maybe that's a, a tick or two too high right now. But either way, it's significant to to where the the Big Twelve is thought of and what K State is fighting an uphill battle with. You, you want to be in the conversation with those teams preseason that way there's the hype there's the thought that hey we can be here and then also once you get into the season build off of that because you want to be better than what those expectations are so I, I think we'll see how it goes for k-state i it's it's certainly not time to panic yet but we are getting closer to that point where you start to really question is k-state going to be able to accomplish this and do it I think right now, based off of what they've already added, they're good pieces. There's no reason to think that they aren't going to to finish this thing off with one or two more players that are really big-time difference makers. And then at that point, um, especially like, again, the, the possibility would be there that Arthur Kaluma backs out of the NBA draft and comes back. I mean, that's the thing, too. Like, it's, it's like in pro sports when we talk about, oh, you know, their biggest trade deadline acquisition was actually this guy because he missed the first two months of the season, but he's back now. You know, it's like getting that. It's like, well, actually, you know, it's just getting their full team together. But that's what it would feel like with Arthur Kaluma. It would be like getting another guy out of the transfer portal if he decides to return. And if you do that, just factor it in now. He comes back. That's four spots. You get battle. That's three spots. And then 
you're still hoping for a Mori, but at that point, you say, hey, we, we can fill it out elsewhere and take a little bit of a lesser player than Clifford Amore because we feel pretty good, at least, with how everything's going. So it, there's reason to still be optimistic. There's um, It's fair to anybody that has some trepidations moving forward and is feeling uneasy about how the roster sits right now, but I would say give it probably two and a half, three weeks before you really fully melt down. Uh, on how things go, or if anybody jumps ship. Like, I don't expect that to happen, but certainly uh, the the attitude and everything could change if somebody else is like, yeah, you know what, screw it, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, I would just say be patient. I mean, players are entering the portal every day and will be until May 1st. So, I mean, I, mean, I, I know that it's another guard, so it's not like the greatest example, but I mean, we just, the Patriot player of the league player Patriot league player of the year from Colgate just entered the portal like 10 minutes ago. So yeah. the, the portal is getting more talented still. And I think that you'll still see some big names pop off later on in the next few days. I believe that if you want to be on the portal officially by May 1st, that you have to be like, fill out your paperwork by Tuesday, I, I think is what I saw. So, I mean, we'll probably see more names pop up over the next day day and a half and then may 1st when everybody's officially in that has to be in because i think that it kind of went under the radar that or to some people that grad transfers also have to be in on may 1st Mm -hmm. so the portal officially closes may 1st and we'll kind of assess from there of what the rest of the portal looks like Yep, we'll uh, we'll see how it goes, but a lot left to do for K State. Five open roster spots, and uh, the, they certainly probably feel like they want to get that number at least whittled down to three or two remaining spots uh, in the very very near future. So that will do it for Drew Galloway. I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching K State Online. For more on K State basketball and football recruiting right now, head over to On Three. Find KSO. You can either go straight to the K-State channel or find us directly at kstateonline.com and stay locked in right here on the KSO YouTube and podcast platforms because we'll have stuff all throughout the week for you. D.Y. and I will be here on Tuesday talking football. Yeah, he is alive. That is confirmed. I think it's been about a week, week and a half since we've seen him, but he is alive. And uh, we'll be here tomorrow. We'll talk football coming off the heels of the Dylan Edwards edition and what that means for the bigger picture of this team now, because we've talked a lot about certain positions and how it's going to work out. But now there's a whole different perspective with uh, another major talent piece added to the roster. So we're out of here back again tomorrow, talking football on KSO.